day. Okay. All right. Um, Sarah, are you on? I okay. am. All right. So our next speaker will be Dr. Sonia Swiger. She's the Associate Professor and Extension Entomologist. And she's actually in the Stephenville office. And she's going to talk about external parasite control options for beef cattle. Dr. Swiger, are you on? Yes, I am. Ah, perfect. There you are. Well, welcome. I screen changed just as soon as I was getting ready to do <laughs> not well, to Of course. <laughs> okay. Where did it go? Oh, apologies. Never had to do that before. Okay. No All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, and you should be able to share your screen if you've got slides, I believe is correct. Okay, there is there is a presentation already shown, is that? That's that's Casey's, but it'll, if you hit share screen, it should be able to change over to yours. I can do that. All right, and we are now seeing your desktop. There you go. Okay, excellent. Sorry about that. No problem. Turn it over okay. to you. Thanks. Uh, all right, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, today we'll, we'll get started, and now we're going to talk about some external parasites. So, as Sarah said, I'm Sonia Swiger. I'm an extension entomologist out of Stephenville uh, with livestock focus and mosquitoes mostly, um, and I pretty much take care of the entire state when it comes to those pests. So today we're going to talk about the different flies that can be of concern when dealing with your cattle. Um, obviously we're getting into fly season. Some are already here. Some will be here in the next coming months. And depending on where you live exactly, you may be dealing with certain ones at certain times that were that other people aren't. Um, so the main ones are kind of shown in this picture. I, I like to throw this picture up first because not all flies are equal. Uh, some are similar and have, you know, similar behaviors, but they do have a lot of differences. The first and most important is the horn fly, which is found majority of the time on the back of the animals, can be up on the neck. When it gets hot uh, later in the year, as we get into the late summer and the higher temperatures, they will go down to the belly um, and kind of hide underneath during the hind times of the day. In addition, on the back, we will see horse flies coming in and striking in those areas. Uh, so this is usually representative of having blood dripping down the animals, um, whether these are cattle or horses. Uh, I know we're focusing on cattle, but do remember if you have horses that they will be heavily impacted by horse flies as well. On the legs, we see uh, staple flies, which are currently out at this time um, and are kind of, this is their time of the year. We'll talk about them in detail. They do focus on biting on the leg area of the animals. In addition to that, if you have heel flies, which are also called the cattle grubs, they could be seen at this time of the year and then in the next coming months. And they do focus on the legs where they attach their eggs at. And then anything you're seeing on the face, even um, for those of you that are up in the northeast Texas side of uh, northeast part of the state in Texas here, you probably are still only seeing house flies. We do have a fly referred to as a face fly, but it's not been noted to be in Texas, and if it is here, it's expected to be in the northern part of the panhandle. So we're going to talk about all of these five, well not all of them in detail, but some of them in detail, and if we have time we can talk about others at the end. Uh, but we're going to focus on horn flies because horn fly is the number one fly of concern when dealing with cattle. This is one that's going to constantly be present. Um, they are present all year round. The cooler temperatures will obviously impact their populations. Uh, they have already probably started to come out for this year. Some of you may be dealing with them in higher numbers than others, um, depending on the amount of rain and the warm weather you've had in your area. But this is our number one biting ectoparasite in the fly category, and probably of any of the categories when it comes to cattle. They live exclusively with cattle. Uh, they prefer their manure for their, the larva to grow in. They will bite on other animals from time to time, but their preference is cattle. So both males and females are, um, are blood feeders. The bites are very painful. 
they don't have the ability to really take in a large blood meal. So they take small blood meals, which means that they feed many times a day. Uh, and it's listed about 30 to 40 times a day. And obviously each time that every bite has an impact on your animals. Because of their small size, the economic threshold is higher than you would expect for a fly. A lot of times our thresholds are like just a few flies, but in this case we can do 250 flies per cow. Uh, this picture here though is clearly well over that level. Um, and some animals can handle higher numbers and not be that upset by it. Uh, so this economic threshold number is kind of more of what used to be considered of concern before lots of changes in the way we breed our animals. So some now are more tolerant. Uh, we have data out of New Mexico and even out of Oklahoma it shows they can really handle almost up to 500 to maybe even a thousand depending on which breed you have um, and just that animal in particular before they get upset. So threshold is really when is your animal most upset and more concerned about attacking the flies on their back than they are in feeding. But it is a big impact on the industry. It's, it's estimated to be about a billion dollar um, impact dealing with horn flies. And, and you know, it is tough to kind of get those numbers uh, since other factors do play a bigger role, but these are definitely something we don't want to ignore. So as I briefly mentioned before, they do stay exclusively with the cattle. That is their focus point for livestock, for their ability to survive and their life cycle to go on. Um, they will buy other animals within proximity though, but they're going to have to go back to the pastures where the cattle are because the eggs can only grow in the, uh, the eggs and the larvae in the um, cattle manure. And they like very fresh cattle manure. So when you do find hornfly adult females dropping down to get into the manure, it's probably just been laid. Um, we did a research project several years ago where we had to collect that freshly laid manure and they were right down there with us um, as soon as it was coming out. So they do like to get their eggs laid in there quickly and then you know they're hidden underneath that crust that will form after the manure has been sitting there. So when we're talking with insect control, um, we, we want to talk integratively, right? So it's integrated pest management is the coin terminology that we use for any type of pest control situation out there. Um, and it means you guys most likely have pesticide license. You probably have heard this term. You, you see it listed on TDA's website for multiple pests. The same is with cattle pests. Now with us, we are a little limited but we want to at least talk about the potential of having some integrated approaches. So to be integrated, you look at multiple ways of controlling these insects. Uh, we like to start from the least chemically based or least invasive up to, you know, ones that kind of fall in, in our chemical categories, which a lot of people like to put at the top of that little pyramid as your last resort. Like I said, for us, it's pretty much our only resort, but we will talk about some options. So first being biological. Uh, biological control is basically modifying in some ways or using what nature has given us. So we're taking what's already happening out there, whether we were playing a role in it or not, and trying to make it occur more often. So uh, making the environment more beneficial so that other insects want to hang around. So predators are shown here we don't really have much control over predators. They're gonna be there or they're not gonna be there, but just good to know that they are, they are there. Uh, competition, so we do have our competitor insects. In this case, the dung beetle is probably lead on that one, especially with pastured animals. Um, they're out there, they do their thing. They don't have much of an impact from what we're doing. Uh, there is data that shows though the using inter, 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 inter um, internal parasite products do have some decrease to their population but from what we've seen around the state while that is probably happening they are still live and well and doing a very good job so what the dung beetle does is it doesn't necessarily go in and start eating on the larva like a predator would it goes in and takes away that food source so they're all using the same food source so that's why it's considered a competitor the other fly that's shown here next to this dung beetle is what we call a black soldier fly or stratiomyid um, they are currently on the rise of usage for um, food sources for I think fish and chicken is kind of where you know fish and birds and animals of that sort that that we see this because they're able to break down organic matter and become useful for feeding other animals. 
but they also found out there in nature doing their thing. And we typically see them more heavily associated with barns, but you may see them from time to time if, if you happen to go look for them. And then the other one is the parasitoid wasp. This is probably the most popular of the biological control uh, agents we have. Um, a lot of wasps are utilized in different ways. There are different species of wasps. So if you do feel the need you wanna try these out, do make sure you purchase ones that are de designated for flies. Um, Cause there's different types of wasps that attack different types of insects. <clears throat> the concept between these about these wasps is they're very small, so you can kind of see them here. Um, if any of y'all have ever seen fly puparia, they're they're less than their quarter inch. So this is just an itty bitty little wasp trying to come out of there. But this wasp will find these puparia, which is the stage prior to turning into an adult for a housefly, and lay their eggs in there. And the concept is the wasp larva eats the fly larva, and then you don't get a fly. Um, they are effective in the sense that they will do their thing. The, fly, the wasp is going to do what it's supposed to do. This is what it's supposed to do. They do not match up one to one ratio. So if you do go this route, you have to purchase quite a few of them to make this effective. Because uh, a wasp female can lay about 60 eggs in her lifetime and horn flies and house flies and stable flies can lay 500 to 1,000 per female. Uh, so not, not a head uh, matchup. My other major um, thing I like to mention about them, major concern, is that they are not effective in pastures. So it's not that they aren't going to do their job, it's just pastures are big. So unless you have a small size pasture and can get you access to those to the manure paddies that are left behind where the larvae are growing, the impact is very minimal. Uh, because it's too much work for these little wasps to fly through the acreage to find all these puparia. So they are a better use of your money, which is really the main concern here because they're not cheap, and your time if you have a managed manure system, which typically goes with a barn and not pasture-raised raised cattle. Uh, so do keep that in mind. They're not cheap. They are much more effect, uh, costly than using different, various chemical options. And this just kind of shows a bag um, that I'd seen at a, a, a conference before where it's about, it's about a foot long bag. You can see those little tiny wasps in there as they start to emerge. So next, we're, we're gonna move up this pyramid here. Well, what we can, else can we do that's gonna prevent us having to use chemicals? We go to cultural and mechanical. Uh, with horn flies, this is also still very difficult. We have a lot of chemical, cultural, or uh, cultural mechanical options when dealing with house flies and different other flies, but horn, horn flies, not so much. Uh, one option is to rotate your pastures. Now, if you have that ability, I know that in some parts of the state, the pastures are already fairly small. You only have so much room, there's not much we can do. But if you have a larger area, you basically divide it in half, divide it in fours, whatever you can manage to do, and then you rotate. The concept is you're letting that one pasture completely dry out. So you wanna go in after you've moved the cattle off and drag it and pull that manure and make it unsuitable habitats for fly production is basically what you're trying to do. Um, and hoping that that may have some impact. The other thing would be to look at traps. Um, traps are really more of a surveillance tool for a lot of our insects, but in this incidence, we're trying to actually make an impact on the flies. So they've looked at these for years. This trap over here on the left is what we call a Bruce trap. I personally have never seen it. It was developed many years before I was born by one of our researchers, um, senior researchers, and the concept is decent the effectiveness is not as decent. So um, it's, it's basically like a little makeshift hutch where the cows walk through. When they come in, there's material that will knock those flies off their body because you're just kind of upsetting the flies. They're supposed to fly up, get caught in the sides, which are got slatted materials for them. That's a great concept. It's not a very great tool. So it's about a 5% uh, reduction in that situation. And then the cow vac is our newer version of this. This is kind of the same concept. Cows walk in, air blows across them to dislodge those horn flies, and then they get sucked up into a vacuum. So the concept on that is really great. The problem is, is this machine is not something you can just take and sit anywhere. It's, it's a very large piece of machinery. It has to be put up with a forklift. It has to be grounded with a decent power source. You can't run it off an extension cord. Um, so this is not a portable option, which makes it not real usable in the pasture. 
so the concept was to design, it was designed for dairy cattle and horn flies. And in Texas, that's not something we see a lot of. So for us, it's not really usable for the dairies because they're not dealing with horn flies. And it's not usable for our beef pastures, which have the horn flies because we can't, you all can't afford most of the time to run out and buy one of these, which are roughly $8,000. And then you don't have the way to run them. So we are kind of limited to chemicals, but that's okay. It's about using your chemicals properly. And when we talk about proper chemical usage, that's understanding the active ingredient behind your chemicals, understanding which ones are designed to do what and to rotate when you can or intermix. The first one shown here is our feed-throughs. Um, our feed-through products are very different than anything else you'll see out there because they actually kill larva. Nothing else is going to kill the larva. Now you saw like some of those biologicals. Yeah, they're going after larva because those are easy prey. You can't catch the adult flies. But for chemical options, this is it. Uh, so I always think that if you can use feed-throughs, you're doing a great job because you're getting two-way control. Uh, so I find it more as a tool to be added with another. Now you can use it solely by itself, but you get best results if you can add it with something else. Um, yes, it may cost a little more, but in the long run, it may not. Uh, you know, that's just something you'd have to rework out. I hear a lot of times from people, well, it's, you know, I'd rather spray, but by the end of the season, you're spraying a whole lot more than you were at the beginning of the season, and maybe you could have lowered those costs with other methods. Plus, the benef other benefit with a feed-through is that the active ingredients that are found in these products are not found in our topicals for our adults, so we're not going to get insects side resistance. Now the Raybon is a little different. That's those licking blocks that you, that you find at the feed stores. Those do have organophosphate as the active ingredient and that's but that's still not a chemical that we can purchase anymore in any other form other than ear tags. Uh, so these are going to have a different active ingredient that are going to kill those larvae and there should be no resistant overlap into the adults. Um, so there is benefits for using them. There's some disadvantages in that they don't kill any adults at all. Uh, so you do need to take that into consideration if you do live close to a group of cattle, that someone may not be doing proper management of their flies, they will still come over. Um, but no resistance has ever been found with these products. So that's another benefit. Next is porons. Um, Porons are something that I know that producers like to utilize, and that's great. Um, we, we don't discourage people from using what they want to use. It's what you're comfortable with, what you're familiar with, but you need to understand your product. So when you do use them, use them properly, read the labels, follow the correct dosage. Some of them are, say, to set your gun for the largest animal on your group. Make sure you're doing that. So do make sure you do read the label prior to treating. Um, the other thing about a poron is it's not long lasting in that, yes, it's going to last maybe three to four weeks, depending on the time of the year. And that's great. That's longer than most, but you do have to repeat it. So, you know, don't expect to do this once and walk away from it. Another thing is there's two groups here. I have two different columns. One has got a box around it and one does not. The products in the box are internal parasite products. Um, and it's very important with, you know, to follow the guidelines that we get from our colleagues like Dr. Hergove previously on this situation because our internal parasite products are very, very, very limited. They are very similar. These are all acting on the, oops, apologies there, on the, um, lorem, the worms, different various worms that would be found on the internal side of the animal in the same manner. So we don't want to overuse these products is where I'm getting with this. Um, for each one of those, when you put in products for your internal parasites, there's a certain time of year, depending on the amount of moisture you get, you may do it twice a year. Many people only do it once. So use these products the first time when you need to do that. You will get fly control for probably 30 days. But after that, and you still want to continue a pour on, you need to switch to one of these other products. This list of other products here, these are permethrins pyrethroids. They are not going to have any impact on your internal parasites. So that's, that's very important when working with porons because you want to then kill the flies continuously because you're going to have to keep retreating, but you don't want to cause resistance to those internal parasites. Dust bags and back rubbers um, have the convenience of putting them out and they can basically self-treat. So that's very awesome. That's very good tools to use. Um, 
I've seen a lot of different ways that these are used and a lot of people who use them are very happy with them. I, I don't know, there's some people who are not familiar with these, but if you've used them and you like them, definitely a good tool. Uh, the important part is to make sure they get used daily and to make sure that the product stays you know, in, in the, the rubbers, especially these back rubbers, you want it to stay charged, right? You wanna make sure there's uh, enough product in it to keep it so it doesn't dry up and things of that sort. I mean, obviously it's gonna happen, but you want it to be effective. Sprays, um, I find sprays to have a place as being an added tool. I know some people like to keep it as their main choice and that's fine. If that's something you're comfortable with, you have a small size herd, you can do that, then, then that's great. For some people, spraying is too much work because their herds are too large. They have other jobs that they're managing on a regular basis and cattle are kind of on the side. So you have to figure out what works best for you. Um, so whatever you do with sprays, just make sure, again, you read the label and you treat according to the label. The other thing about sprays is if you do decide to use it as an added tool, they're great to use early in the season to kind of knock down early populations when you start your feed throughs or when you put your ear tags in. They're also a great tool for about midway through season because we have seen over the last several years of doing research, and I'll show some of that here in a minute, that no matter which year we're talking, by August and September, we are gonna see a spike, because that's just how it works in Texas. Um, the horn fly is known to have a higher temperature uh, affinity, so to speak. They hit a peak in the middle of summer. Well, in Texas, it's not really a peak in the middle of summer. It's, they head to that peak by the August, September, and they stay there almost until fall or almost winter sometimes. So it just depends and two sprays can be very helpful in dealing with those high populations. Ear tags have the benefit that when you put them in, they stay in for four to five months and they're effective. Um, most every ear tag we have tested will give us four to five months control, about 20 weeks to 24 weeks, some months, some years we get longer, some years we don't some locations do better than others. So just because an ear tag didn't work for you one year doesn't mean all ear tags don't work for you. We are seeing some, we um, haven't been able to officially research this just yet. Um, maybe this year if things kind of get back to normal, we can do that. But we are seeing resistance, especially with pyrethroids in certain parts of the state. So if you have used ear tags in the past and aren't happy with the results, but like the convenience of them, we'd be glad to work with you to try and find something that may work out better for you. The other thing about ear tags is this is an area of products where we can rotate to get, not to prevent that insecticide resistance from occurring. There's organophosphate tags. We don't have organophosphate chemicals anywhere else other than, like I said, that licking block. There's macrocyclic lactone. Outside of the vet gun, which I'm going to show you next, this is the only place you're going to find that for external parasites. And there's pyrethroids. So all the other products, all the sprays, all the porons, all the back rubber options are pyrethroids. So sometimes you have got to find other options because these will become, our horn flies will become very resistant to pyrethroids. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the last product, um, option, so to speak, because this is kind of in its class on its own, is the vet gun. So I know that there are a few in North, in East Texas that have used the vet gun. So if you've used it and you like it, um, that's great to hear. The, it, it's kind of just depends on who you are. It's similar to a paintball. I say that the cows, for the most part, don't even care. Um, you, you shoot at their shoulder, the side of their leg, the shoulder area. The, it doesn't hurt them. It's designed not to. Um, there is, you know, it does have to be an animal over 600 pounds, so we don't get anything smaller than that. It is like a pour-on product that you're shooting at them, though, so it does have to be reapplied. Uh, so that is something to be aware of. It is a little pricey, but I've used the same gun since the day we started testing this, and I think we started testing these at least six or seven years ago with the vet gun, and never had to get a different one. So they've held up well. Um, and about, and then you just have to make sure you manage the caps properly so that they don't get distorted or too hot or too cold if you have them riding around in your car. And obviously in summertime, it's worried about them getting too hot because then they can break or melt. So something we've done for several years is we've looked at what we 
started doing was looking at ear tags and the effectiveness um, of these ear tags in Texas. We've added in the vet gun and from time to time we add in sprays. We also add in insect, the, um, the free feed through products if people are using them and will let us get the counts. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to provide that myself because of cost. This study that we've done um, is done per county and the agents are a part of it. And what we do is basically we provide we provide the material, so the ear tags for the herds that are being tested and used in this project. In the project, they are not expected to put anything else on them. And then our guys, our our agents, will go out there and do weekly counts. Um, so this is a collaborative effort. We refer to it as a demonstration. It's a result demonstration. We've actually been able to publish some of the data we've gotten from these projects. Um, so it does. You know, it just depends where you're on the state. If you do have an interest, you may be able to convince your county agent. I know some of the agents that are helping today are already a little overbooked with certain things, so we won't want to push them too hard. Um, but we basically start tagging in the next couple of weeks. As soon as the tags come in, they stay into October. And after they're tagged, it's just doing weekly counts to see how many flies we get on them. So for the last several years, um, we've done this throughout the state, and this just kind of shows the various areas. As you can see, it does tend to be more central to east, northeast Texas. Um, in 2018, we did actually get some people in the southern part of the state that, caught, that got interested in it. We've had some various people down in southeast Texas that have joined in. A lot of times, every time we get those groups in, it ends up raining heavily. Um, so we have run into some natural disaster issues in the last couple of years, but that's just how it goes. Um, so this is a project that from year to year changes as to how many are going to be involved. In this last year, we had several, seven different counties that actually were able to collect some data. So the products we tested, again, are the ones I just talked to you about, the, the various ear tags. Sometimes there's more that we can provide in that, depending on what we're getting from our, produ from our uh, industry partners and then the vet gun products. Uh, so what I've tried to do here is because every year varies a lot, I like to, in the least in the last five years, I've got 2018 and 2019's data to kind of show some comparisons. Um, when we did these projects in 2018, you can see this top line, the control herds, like I said, they do increase continuously throughout the season. So we're hitting our peaks late, and this is going to be around September, late August, early September, when we start to hit that top part of it, or the low part of the peak, and then it ends out. And we usually stop around October um, 31st with my, all of this so you can see that no matter what, our populations are significantly higher in the latter part of the summer, early fall months than they are compared to now. So a lot of people get really antsy right around now. I want to go and put my tags out there. And yes, you may be getting close to where it's time to put your tags out there, but you don't want to treat too soon because your product is not going to make it to October and it needs to make it to October or you need to be willing to do something. In addition to that, um, the way this data is shown here is it shows an increase and it's all the data cumulatively recorded. Some of the tags just don't hold up. The Python seems to be one that I've been seeing a lot of that. It does vary from county to county, <laughs> but then other ones do hold up pretty well. Um, the only downfall when we do some of this data is that sometimes we don't get the best information given to us, so it does kind of skew some of the little bit of data, so we try to exclude any data that's not complete. Now 2019, as you can see, now our herd, our numbers were much lower, so the top number here is eight, just over 8,000, and our top number here is 4,000. So the number of flies out there last year recorded was half of what we recorded the year before. So that's why I say every year is different. And sometimes when that happens, it makes our products not look as effective. But this here is just kind of showing our number of horn flies. So there's no impact compared to the control. And again, our Python, now two years in a row, really just isn't holding up very well. Um, that is something I have seen happening. This is something I can relay to the company and hopefully they can look into this and maybe start seeing why. Um, some of the others up here, the Guard Star and the Magnum. Now, again, these are all pyrethroid products that are all losing their effectiveness, and that's been an issue for at least the last decade. 
the ones that seem to hold up are going to be our organophosphate tags. So we have our warrior tag down here, our optimizer tag, and then even our XP820, which is the abamectin. These are, are the ones that seem to be much more effective on a regular basis. Again, it's varied. You want to put that out there. Some counties that just don't get the greatest results, no matter what I give them. Um, to kind of look at that a little, you know, in a little different concepts, the same kind of thing. This is just to show an average number of hornflies. So what we're goal is we want to stay under 100 per side. And this is counting on one side. And if you look at it this way, all the products did that, except for the python. But when you're out there looking at your animals, that changes that. That too. So yes, the data says, okay, it's, it's managing to keep it under 100. Some of these are kind of high. They're up in the 90s. Um, but is it still considered effective? And that's always been kind of the hard part to figure out. What do you, does the producer find effective and what does the data say is effective? What I've done here is I took those average numbers which are presented here and I put them with our numbers from 2018. And like I said, every year is very different. So 2018, you can see double the number of flies counted on our controls and compared to 2019. But for most of the other products, most of these other bars, the 2019 data is slightly higher um, or just as similar to the 2018. Again, there's variations. It's, it's been really kind of one of those things that we can look at this data 17 different ways and say something different about it. Um, it's hard to exactly say, uh, apologies, I took off the top of this one, which product is best for your county. This uh, chart here is supposed to show that percent of control. And again, it's a comparison of 18 to 19, um, 18 being in the blue and 19 being in the red. Um, so some of our products, we had one or two here that still, they even with the 19's data not looking as beautiful as the 18 data because uh, of the variations, the product actually worked better. And that it could be because it's in a different county. But, you know, it's just every year is a little different. The way you look at this is there are some changes in the products from year to year in their effectiveness. And there's something that's impacting that that we're not entirely sure what that is. So now we're going to switch gears uh, to kind of keep us on task here and on time to stable flies. The stable fly is a fly that's only present a few months out of the year, but when it's here, it can be quite impacting. Um, it's the one here on the left. It kind of looks like a house fly when it's out and about, and when it comes flying through your house, if that happens, and I've had it happen to me here because we have a horse next door, and they don't always keep it the cleanest over there. Um, those flies will come in, you'll think it's a house fly until it bites you, and that's a big difference. But these are a biting fly, so you can see that mouth part that protrudes, um, and they prefer to be outdoors. They're not really an indoor species, um, but they can come inside. They prefer to bite on the legs of the animals. Now, the animals they choose are usually going to be cattle or horses, but that's not limited to that. We've heard of them, we have data of them attacking different types of large birds. They will feed on dogs, they will feed on humans. With dogs, they usually get the ones with the stand-up ears and they eat the top parts of the ear. So you'll see that damage if you're in an area where there's a lot of them. They do not stay on the animals very long. They take a single blood meal every day. Like and like the horn fly, which is always there to feed, these guys and gals are not. So both males and females, again, are blood feeders the presence of fly will probably be all throughout the day but that same fly will not be there all throughout the day because of this nature and this behavior they're super super hard to control they're one of our most difficult and while i i like working with them doing the research it's always tough when i get a call about them because there's not a lot i can tell you to do that's going to be effective um same with horse flies just in case you're dealing with horse flies but we have some suggested options one of the things we know about this stable fly is we think of flies as being, especially flies that we call filth flies, which that's what these are, these muskids are in, the house flies, the horse flies, the horn flies, the um, stable fly, where they call it, sometimes referred to as a, a filth fly. But these do not grow necessarily in feces, manure. They can develop in rotting vegetation just as well, if not better. Most of the time when we find them, it is because there's rotting 
material of some type of vegetation present and then manure got mixed into it or urine got mixed into it but it's the vegetation that was what really caused the the growth of them so in a lot of cases this is hay and that's okay we, we're not going to say no don't use the hay bales we obviously got to feed our animals what we're going to say is we got to clean up after our animals so this is a situation where it takes you to do the work to get rid of them. So if you're dealing with stable flies, they are super unpleasant for your animals. They will bunch, they will stay away from the food if that's where the heavy populations are, and they will hide in water. So if you have a tank, they'll be standing in there and you're thinking it's not even that hot out, why are all my animals in the tank right now? It's the stable flies. You know Oh, you have stable flies because the cattle are bunching and they're stomping and they and they're really unpleasant more so than a horn fly they can't tolerate the stable flies as much as they can a horn fly so if you do deal with them and not everybody does but if you're having an issue with them number one is you have to clean if you're using hay bales go out there and clean up after them so our suggestion is with hay bales there's two options so i've had a producer one time he kept his on a trailer and then every time he put that trailer somewhere new and it got rid of his stable fly issue. He was in dairy country and he had a lot of them and they all went away for the most part. The other option is you put them in a new spot. Every time you bring a hay bale out, move it to a new location in the pasture and clean that old area up. You eventually can go and rotate back to that area, but you have to go clean this mess up. So you see all this that they're walking through. They're not going to feed on that. They're going to lay in it. They're going to smash it. They're going to urinate and defecate on it, and it becomes a breeding site. And then every time it rains, that's a breeding site. So the stable fly has a, re a preference for cooler temperatures. So every time it rains, that temperature drops. Another option, we can put traps out, but traps are not a control only measure. They are not going to catch every one of them. So they're an option to help lower the number of depositing eggs or a potentially males that are going to mate. But you know that sometimes our traps are male heavy and not female heavy. So what kind of an impact are we having if there's not as many females on there as you know we would like because they're still laying their eggs? Uh, there is a screen material that we can utilize. It has delta methrin in it, and it's very effective on stable flies. It, sometimes it's about how to make it effective in the field without the cows taking it, because they will do that. So data we have seen, um, and I, I, want to, I meant to take that slide out, but y'all can kind of see this. This is some data we've had over the last couple years, 16 and 17 here, um, and you can see this distinct the increase in population and decrease. So what I did here is I took the data from 16, 17, and 18. So 2016, 17, 18, and put it all together. And, and this data is out of Comanche and Erath counties mostly, but it's very similar to what you all will probably see in your area too. Um, we start to see them come out as soon as the, you know, it starts to get tad bit warmer than winter, right? So shows February start date here. We can record them all year long though in some parts of the state and in, in, even up here in the north. They will increase, which we're right in the center of this peak population, um, depending on rain will alter this. That's why this peak is a little bit earlier than this one. This putting the three years together, we get a variation because of weather content, however much rain we got. When it's drier, that peak comes faster and then it drops quicker. When it's uh, more like it has been the last couple of days where we're getting overcast days, we're getting some rain, that peak can take a little longer. One thing we do know is that come basically the 4th of July, they're going to crash. They don't do well in the summers, uh, so they'll be gone all through the summer. And sometimes, now this isn't every year, but sometimes we get this late, these fall peak times. So this is November shown here in the latter part of this map or graph, and this is December, this very last point. And that was, I distinctly remember that December, it was a couple years back when we had an 80 degree weather in December. But that's perfect stable fly weather. Knowing the seasonality data helps us to pinpoint when it's time to treat for stable flies because chemicals don't really work. But this is where you can focus to do extra management of the hay, or if you do need to use traps, put the traps out. These aren't a whole year long effort is what we're trying to show there. <coughs> so next we're going to talk horseflies. 
Um, I'm going to assume most of y'all have dealt with the horsefly issue. Now you may not, you may be one of the lucky ones, but most of my horsefly traps are located in y'all's part of Texas right now because um, East Texas is where we're going to see them. The horseflies and the deerflies, which can both be together, um, they're in the family Tabanidae, which is a, a family of large blood feeding flies. They get grouped together, even though there are some differences because of their appearance, because of their large eyes, because of the way they feed. Um, so they, we do call them horse flies. It's usually the ones you're gonna deal with when cattle are present, but I have a situation right now where deer flies are really bad at a, a family home and we've taken traps to this family because they're getting eaten alive by the deer fly, which do have a tendency to bite humans more than horse flies, but that doesn't mean it's exclusive that, that way. Their, baits, their bites are super, super painful because they cannot pull the blood in into sucking mouth parts. They have to cut holes and then feed on that dripping blood. So that makes it really unpleasant. And they can vector diseases. Um, again, it depends on the location of where you're at in the state if you're gonna deal with this, but anthrax has been, always been kind of that one we watch them for. Uh, they also can be maybe a player in transmission of tularemia. Some of the stuff they can and can't do, it, whether or not they're super effective at it always changes, but they have really dirty mouth parts. So that's how they carry that, those different diseases. The really bad part about horse flies is chemicals are not that effective. Now, the thing is, is if you're treating for your horn flies already, which is what you really want to put the chemicals out for, you hope to get some control for your horse flies. When I've had calls with people and I feel bad because some to half the time it's horses and the horses are even less options. Everything out there is permethrin and a horse fly is not usually going to die from permethrin. But we try to find ways we can get a, some control. If it's a really heavy population, I recommend porons because it's a little bit thicker chemical contrast, concentration at that time. It won't last the whole time for them, but it'll help some. The other thing that we do recommend is if you can pull them away from areas where the flies are most prevalent, we know that they like to be on tree lines. Um, they're not usually in heavy, dense, forested areas on large numbers. I don't think it helps. I don't think they can see their host as easily if it's too dense. Um, and they're not usually in open pastures because open pastures is a lot of open space and there's not enough coverage. So there's a lot of, it's a little too warm. So where we find them is where there's bunches of trees or tree lines around the pasture. So if you can keep your animals away from those at certain times of the day, the other option is to use traps. Um, so we've tested and are still testing because we're still trying to figure out this data because every time we go to look at an area, the flies disappear because that's what they like to do to us. But we have the horse pal trap out right now and we have the H trap out right now to look for different numbers of flies, different species of flies. So far we are seeing pretty similar species in Texas. So we've tested this in a few different places. This is just one of the tests we ran uh, to kind of show this H trap. This is a very large trap. These are very hardy traps. So if you do decide to purchase them, and I usually do recommend it for really bad areas, these are about a $300 trap. And actually I just bought a bunch of these H traps and I think they ran me about $325. Um, so the price has gone up a little but these are large, large traps. This young lady here is about five feet tall and this trap is her size and it's still missing the piece that goes in the ground. So these are not traps that can be destroyed is where I like to go with that. So yeah, it's an investment, but it should last you from the day you buy it until who knows how long. Um, I would say that this material will eventually maybe rot, but I haven't had that happen yet and it's gonna take a long time for that to occur. So hopefully 10 or more years. So we've placed these out and done some collections. What we did find in the most important part of the data with the horse flies and the H, the H trap there is that they work. Um, the numbers we're getting do vary based on county. So this is a comparison from Harrison County and Houston County. And as you can see, one county had more deer flies collected than the others. And that's just the composition for that area. Um, I don't think the trap had anything to do with that because when you put that together and run it through to different analysis, there's no differences in the sense that the trap was playing a part. It's just the location probably. But if you are looking for an option to bandage or your problem, I do think these traps are effective. We're still working on data and actually currently right now we have these traps in Franklin County, Camp County, 
I just took them to Smith County and they're in Bowie County. Um, so in that Northeast Texas area and they ha are out there, we're working on trying to get data and I think we're gonna be taking them back to Houston County here as well. And then the last one I have on here is houseflies. Um, I, I like to mention houseflies because there are a few new products, not a lot. It, sometimes these are not a problem for people. It just depends on your proximity for your, your cattle to your house. Or if you have dogs, I'm currently having a problem with houseflies because I have a Great Dane who opens doors. And as he comes in and out daily, and as they're all home right now, the flies are coming in constantly. Um, <clears throat> so houseflies are a bigger issue for us as humans than they are the animals, but they can be super annoying. Uh, nobody wants them in their house. And they are carriers of pathogens. Uh, the, the, because of there, they like to eat and where they like to lay their eggs, they do get a lot of interaction with a lot of different pathogens. And some of these pathogens cause human um, diseases. So we do want to keep our houseflies controlled when possible. It usually takes a ton of stuff though unfortunately to get rid of houseflies they, they are too crafty right they've been here almost as long as probably that cockroach and they're not going anywhere they do really well with us they're domesticated as we say they love to live with humans because we have so much for them to offer for them so we have to do lots of things we have to be clean we have to clean up after ourselves sweep and clean keep our foods for our animals and ourselves contained if you keep stuff open, like open bags of feed, they're going to be all over it. They love the sweetie, sweet stuff. They love all that stuff. So usually when we're dealing with them in pastures, it's because you guys are bringing food to your animals, which is fine. You have to, right? You give them feed. Well, that also brings the flies out there. So that's why that can be a concern. Um, we have to do things which we call mechanical or cultural methods where we vacuum up, we use sticky tape, we have to do lots of things like that as well if you have a really severe problem. And it can get really tough when this problem is homeowners, uh, people who are in areas where they don't have the ability to maybe use the chemicals, but we do have some of those. So we're going to talk about a few of these in a little more detail. Sticky traps do work, right? So like I said, they're good at collecting flies. They don't necessarily rid the flies, but they're helping. They're, they're taking them away from the house, the area, the house or the, the barn, because that's where I would say you want to focus these traps. You're not going to put them out in the middle of a pasture because that's not going to be effective, but they are going to have an impact because they're going to put less flies out there. So you, every female you collect is a less, is five to well, probably more like 800 to a thousand less eggs that can be laid hopefully if you get her before she lays her eggs but she can lay more than one batch of eggs so um, there is an impact by using sticky traps now sometimes they're unsightly and you do have to deal with that it depends on what you want on which trap you pick but we've pretty much if we put a sticky trap out it's going to get covered in flies um, so do find what works best. I, I like this little sticky fly tape when it comes to appearances because it's very thin. You can run this along a barn. I've seen it used at multiple different types of barns. You could even run it along the side of the house if you have an area that's just heavily impacted. The flies do have a tendency to like white surfaces. Um, because the sticky fly tape, you can't see it from far away. And when you get up to it, the flies like to stick to sit on like wires and stuff. And that's what it looks like to them. And then they never come back off. Um, there's now stuff you can put on the insides of your windows inside your house. So you do want to change those probably right before you have company over if you do have flies stuck to it. But flies always go to the windows. So that's a great tool to try and catch some of them without having to chase them with fly swatters. Other options for outside. Um, preferably not around where you're going to stay on a regular basis or eat are these pheromone traps as I call them because they have this stinky attractant that goes inside of them. It smells horrible. Most people are not a fan of it um, except for the flies. The flies love it. So these are really really effective. Which ones you purchase is completely up to you. Just note that these bottom two are throwaway. You use them once and they go in the trash. When they dry up, they're ineffective. I've walked into barns and seen these bags hanging there. They must have been there for years. They're not working anymore. They're not decorative, so don't leave them up. They're not pretty. Um, but if you want to use them, they will work, but you have to properly use them. So we change ours at least once a month when we put them out. If your barn is very heavily full of flies like this 
uh, gallon size container here shows, this is like every two weeks or one week you have to change them. The Captivator and Fly Terminator Pro, that's these two represented in here, they cost more, but these containers are reusable. So you buy it and you can buy literally one container and buy the refill packets that go inside to make the nasty smelly water. And that can last you a whole year and maybe more if you want to after a while they get pretty stinky. In addition to that, we have bait products. Um, some of the same ones that have been out there for years, but the new ones on the market, uh, the Cyanorox, this is the newest one that now is being sold by Central Life Sciences, who sells Quick Strike and the Golden Mowron. And then the this one here, BASF Alpine Pressurized Fly Bait. This is a little different. It's an aerosol, as its name suggests, but not in the sense like it doesn't spray all over in the big cloud. It's heavier droplets. It's designed to be sprayed um, at a particular distance from what you want to attach it to. Um, and then when the flies go onto that material, they will consume it and it will kill them. I have heard after giving a talk that someone said that their family was using it by spraying the legs of tables that were outside. Um, and they were getting great results with this product by doing that because the flies were, you know, congregating there. It was a way to put some treatment out that wouldn't go over the labels, you know, outside that label because you don't want to do that. Um, and still be effective. Then when you use the baits, do remember baits have to be put into containers. They're referred to in the old term as scatter baits. They're not allowed to legally be scattered anymore. They must be put in some type of a container prior to placing outside. So we test these every year as well. Um, this is one of our bigger projects. It's a project we do that a lot of our agents will use our 4-H kids with. So that's kind of a nice tool for them. It educates them. It gets them to probably pay more attention to the fly issues they have in their barns anyways. Um, no matter what, our pheromone traps are always going to win because we can't lose those flies. They get in there, they die, they can't come back out. And they're much more attractive it's a different type of method than using the baits. We added that Cyanorox last year for the first year and at first I wasn't the happiest with it because we tested it in a pig barn in Stephenville and the gentleman has always told me quick bait don't work and he's right and quick stride is his best product and he's right. The Cyanorox did not out defeat out complete the, the quick strike and I was kind of bummed because it's a new product. I want it to be better than all the rest. But when we took it to the state last year and people put it out in the various barns, it did beat everybody else, almost doubled um, some of them. So twice as more than the quick strike, uh, 10,000 more than our quick bait, uh, and then the, almost triple the effectiveness of the golden Mowron. So I was super impressed once we took it to the field to see that various people were getting better results than, than our unfortunate pig barn, which we're still trying to figure out what we're going to do for them. So just to kind of take those ones again to see those numbers for the baits themselves, if you've used scatter baits in the past um, and you need something new, I will say the Cyanorax is not cheap, but hopefully you won't have to use more too much of it. Um, the, the results kind of speak for themselves. Quick bait is an interesting product. Some parts of the state, we do not get effectiveness at all, but then other parts of the state, it works really, really well. And then Quick Strike is going to be your fastest acting if you're looking for something of that sort. Golden Malron is the ancient one on the group here, and it's really starting to not, it, it never produces well. Um, we have every once in a while two or three counties where it's the best, and, and that's about it. So just to kind of recap, and I thank you all for listening today, but to kind of go over these flies again as a whole, when you're dealing with these flies, one big thing to remember is it's a repetitive thing. It's not something you can do one time and walk away from it. Uh, there is a lot of misconception, and I've heard actually that some of our feed stores were telling some of our new landowners that that's all you had to do is treat to today and they're gone forever, and that's not true. Flies are not like that. They regenerate every one to three weeks. Um, and in the summer, it's every week, boom, 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 they're popping out new flies. So you can't just walk away from it. It's not the same fly you killed today that you're trying to kill tomorrow. So you have to keep that in mind. But with our horn flies, the best results is to combine as many products as you can, um, preferably multiple applications, which has to do with getting the larva and getting the adults. Um, and then just those products again for you to see the feed throughs, the tags, the sprays, the rub-ons, 
uh, the porons and the back rubbers. For stable flies, it's seasonal and it's pace to place. Not everybody deals with them. Um, I have seen that if horses are around, you're going to deal with them more than probably just cattle. And if you're near a dairy, the dairies have them in large numbers. So do be careful of that. Sticky traps when you can. And then for the house flies, again, these are going to show up. They're going to stick around. They're going to be a problem. They're going to be a bigger problem as it gets warmer. So you want to get prepared for them. What you use is completely up to you. Just know you're going to have to continue to do something to get rid of them if they're really bad at your area. Um, but with that, I will take any questions if we have time. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I think right now I don't see any questions in the group chat. But if you do have questions, please let us know. If we don't get it now, we can probably get it to Sonia at a later time if we need to. All right, well, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Callie Zeller to introduce our next speaker. Thanks again, Sonia. All right, thank you.